Um, so my name is Kobe Lund. I'm, as you might imagine, I'm a behavior analyst. I actually work in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about, about that in a few minutes. Um, my guess would be just about everybody's back. We had an hour and a half uh, for lunch, so this is, a, this is a pretty good time slot, I think. It looks like a pretty full room, and you all get, won't get tired until about 3, so I think I'm good. <laughs> I have to tell you, I, I, you know, I sort of analyze these time slots maybe more than I should because when I first got out of grad school, I presented my dissertation at the uh, NASP conference. Uh -huh. Is anyone in here a school psychologist? No. Okay, well you weren't at my presentation because I was in the last slot of the last day um, and I had three people, some dude and my mom and my dad, right? Just sitting in back going, that's my boy, that's my boy, he's so smart. Um, so I'm always happy when I don't draw that uh, short stick. Uh, before I get started, I wanted to um, just sort of get an idea for who's here. Um, would you mind raising your hand if you are uh, sort of, I know this is kind of a broad category, but a practicing behavior analyst? I mean, if you actually do behavior analysis instead of just talking about it? Okay, that looks like most of you. Um, any teachers? Okay, a couple teachers. And some familiar faces, yeah, hey. Familiar. Um, so who am I missing? Does anybody want to volunteer to tell me who you are? Animal training. I need to talk to you, by the way. My dog just started peeing in the house again this morning, like after years. So, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know what that's about, but take him outside. <laughs> Brilliant. That'll be $150, right? Um, no, $200. Um, okay, that's good. Well, I, uh, what I want to do is take about um, 45 minutes. I want to save a few minutes at the end for questions and. And of course, we need a little bit of time uh, to transition. And um, I once had a professor in grad school who said, "If you, the two most important things about presenting start on time and finish early, and nobody cares about the rest." <laughs> um, so I've followed that religiously ever since. Um, it's. I think I heard that there are the official numbers are there are 180 people here. So that's that's um, that's pretty good. In Georgia, we also have a state um, chapter. I guess you've been there. That's why you're laughing. <laughs> so we just had our conference, and we had about 80 people. So we were pretty happy with that. And I'll have to go back and report that you're um, doubling up on us. But even as recently as probably seven or eight years ago, we would just meet in people's living rooms. So um, you, it, it seems like you're ahead of us there. So that's encouraging to see. Um, now, as I start to get into the details here, as you might imagine from uh, the title, I'm, I'm going to talk about technology and, and sort of a variety of different technologies that you can use as practitioners. And, you know, as I look through the uh, program for this conference, I see there's a, there's a pretty impressive list of speakers. Um, but I'm just a guy, right? So I'm a practitioner like most of you are. In fact, if you're, uh, the quote that I like best is from uh, Toby Ziegler. Anybody a West Wing fan? Really, nobody? Yeah. All right, well, get, get on uh, Netflix. But to like Toby says, I'm just the guy who does the thing. So um, that's what I'm going to talk to you about. And um, I'll have a variety of data to show you, and, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. But before I do, in a technology presentation, I want to enable some uh, technology use. So for those of you who uh, want copies of these slides, um, you can either copy down that laborious website, or if you have a QR reader on your phone or iPad, you can just snap it right now, and it'll bring up the slides. So hopefully that will uh, encourage a little bit of that. Now, I, I sometimes get people who complain about the dark background, right? So people will say, when, when I print these out, it uses lots of ink. That's meant to be a barrier for printing, don't print things out, right? Use a, a mobile device, she gets brownie points. Uh, use a mobile device like a, an, an iPad or a tablet. Um, now, I have a few other um, just sort of disclaimers that I want to mention as I get into this. I work for a company called Data Finch Technologies, and one of the things that um, we created is a, a technology called Catalyst. and, and 
um, when I get to that section, I'll talk to you about some other products that do similar things. Now, obviously, this is the one that I use, so it's the one that I know most about, but I'm not here to uh, um, sort of talk about that specifically. I want to talk about technology in a general sense that happens to be the uh, electronic data uh, capture and management system that we use, and uh, um, uh, many of the data that I present will be derived from that. But I feel like it's important to point out that there are several other technologies that are similar. Uh, and as you, and I want to talk about how those can help, but you should certainly do that sort of research on your own. Um, now, before I get to that, though, um, I would say about five years ago, um, we started looking for a system like this to be able to use. And for those of you who are practitioners, you can probably empathize with this. I was getting really frustrated uh, with our paper, right? We had mountains uh, of paper. So particularly if you work in the field of autism, uh, you probably measure your paper in pounds, not pages, right? And when you need to do uh, supervision or management or direct uh, intervention, uh, you probably take lots of data. And that is generally on paper, and then it generally goes into a notebook, and then that piles up somewhere. Um, and there are numbers of, uh, a number of barriers to using that data effectively over long periods of time, and even short periods of time, right? Access to it is limited. It's pretty hard to, if a kid has had a, a really intense program for two or three years, it's hard to quickly analyze uh, sort of longitudinal gross pro uh, progress. How, how's this kid done over the last three years? It's hard to do that with three feet of uh, data sheets or, or even, you know, seven or eight pages of, you know, graphs that are going on. So what we wanted to do four or five years ago was find an electronic solution to this. I really wanted to sort of try and get rid of paper. Uh, and I couldn't find anything that would do exactly what we wanted. So there were a few uh, simple applications that would allow for some simple data collection on a mobile device and, and you could sort of use it from the device. And there were a few um, uh, sort of online systems or, or software systems that would allow you to take data on paper and then enter it online. But what we really wanted to do was take data on mobile devices and have it automatically sync to software or an online system. It's the transcription that creates so many errors and takes so much time. So uh, I was lucky enough to run into, we were actually um, um, trying to recruit a software engineer. And at the time, I, I was lucky enough to run into a guy who was just brilliant. And so he uh, created this. And so I'll talk a little bit about that, but mostly uh, in a general sense. Now, I have to tell you, several of the data that I'm uh, going to present, as I mentioned, uh, there's a variety, some archival, some sort of survey, self-report. Um, but, and this is a secondary source here, um, but as Linda LeBlanc would say, don't be a data bigot, right? So uh, you all know the limitations of some of those kinds of data. That doesn't mean that they're necessarily inaccurate. You just have to take them with a grain of salt. So I'll talk about a few kind of self-report uh, pieces of data, and, and some of this is archival, and, and some of it we collected uh, at a school in Atlanta. But I love that saying, don't be a data bigot. Okay, so... Um, there are a couple of things, or, or t basically two main areas that I want to talk about within the provision of uh, state-of-the-art behavior analysis services. And of course, this isn't meant to be comprehensive. These are the two that I sort of want to address in more detail. And presuming everybody here wants to pr uh, provide state-of-the-art uh, behavior analysis services, Clearly, one of the important pieces to that is your people. Um, and it, for those of you who are BCBAs, you probably supervise a number of, um, uh, for lack of a better term, sort of frontline staff, whether it's at uh, an agency or an organization or a school or in people's homes. Um, and managing those people and managing their performance requires uh, quite a bit of training when they get started, and then uh, oversight uh, as they go along. And then, uh, which leads to that second piece, with regard to monitoring, there's quite a bit of monitoring that you need to do, right? And this, is, this includes staff performance, or your staff performance, uh, and the performance of the people receiving your services. 
right? So whether you're talking about uh, kids with autism who are getting intensive ABA programs uh, or adults with disabilities who are receiving services or any number of uh, other people, um, there's quite a bit of monitoring that needs to go on. Uh, I, so I don't know, in, in Tennessee, is there like a standard terminology that you use for sort of that behavior specialist, sort of technician, therapist, or does everybody kind of call them different things? Yeah. Direct support professional is usually one. Okay. Frontline workers, you're talking like direct care. Mm -hmm. uh, used to be direct care, direct The people actually doing behavior yeah. analysis, right. So direct care professionals? Direct, yeah, direct care professionals. <laughs> if they're actually implementing the plan, not, not the ones writing, but if they're the front line implementing the plan. Right, okay. So, you know, clearly there's a lot of monitoring that n you need to include as a part of supervising those people and their performance and making sure that programs are delivered uh, with integrity. And then, uh, <laughs> not sure what that was. Um, and a as a part of that, uh, clearly you have observations. You need to observe staff, you need to observe clients and, and the services that they're receiving. There's quite a bit of data monitoring that needs to go on. This is generally the part that most of us are, we like, right? We sort of nerd out on the monitoring the data and analyzing data. Um, we should, hopefully, everybody be monitoring uh, treatment fidelity. So you're, you have to have some measures of whether programs are being implemented as planned and, and as described. There's quite a bit of monitoring related to just scheduling stuff, right? So I even a, a, a mid-sized or a small organization has several people and, and several clients whom they're serving, there's a lot of scheduling that has to go on there. Um, and that, cr that uh, includes a lot of monitoring as well. And then making monitoring program adjustments based on all of those things, right? So uh, we have a lot of different tasks that we have to do when we monitor the provision of, of ABA services, and they've traditionally been done on paper. Right, so when you do these things well, it's going to take a lot of time, it's going to take a lot of paper, uh, and that's how we've traditionally done things. Now, there are some barriers to the provision of those good state-of-the-art programs. Now, none of these have, you know, been insurmountable, but these things uh, get in the way. Clearly, one of them relates to staff, turnover, training. Are we making sure that uh, staff receive uh, appropriate training? Are they getting good sort of behavioral skills training, um, and are they maintaining their skills at a, at a level that's consistent with how we intend those services to be provided? That's a, that's a barrier, right? So for those of you who supervise more than yourself, uh, and especially if you supervise many people, um, you know that that's just a constant issue. It's difficult to do that uh, consistently over long periods of time. This is one living in Georgia, and I, and I suspect it's similar in Tennessee, that I'm particularly keen about geography. Um, you know, it's great if kids live in my neighborhood or if the people I'm serving live in Atlanta, they're 20 minutes away, I can get to them. Um, but most of Georgia is rural. And I suspect that that's, well, I've looked at a map. It's true of Tennessee as well, right? Ha raise your hand if you live within 40 minutes of Nashville. I actually expected more, but that's still, you know, most of you. Um, ge geography I is a barrier to providing services to everybody who needs them. It's not just urban folks who need our services. And what tends to happen um, in rural areas is there are fewer providers, and even if they can access some services in the city, it's a barrier, right? If somebody's two hours from Atlanta and I agree to work with them, am I going to keep up with that over many years? Am I going to give them exactly what they need or is that what I'm going to skimp on? Well, it's, you know, it's a barrier and even, even finding, you know, sort of, even if you're able to recruit people locally and train them and supervise them, that's, that's hard to do over long periods of time. So one of the things that I'm keen about is uh, solutions that help us serve people in rural areas with the same services that people in the city should expect and that we know that they should be getting. Um, and of course, I'm sure everybody can empathize with this one, time, time is a barrier. It takes time to do all of those things that I was describing. And when, when you're talking about uh, um, tasks that involve paper and driving, those things take a lot of time. So um, I'm actually going to present some data on um, how technology can save you quite a bit of time. 
where some technology solutions can save you quite a bit of time. And then also, lastly, as I mentioned before, one of the barriers is just being able to provide adequate contact, right? Just having boots on the ground, actually getting sort of face-to-face -face time with everybody who needs it. So those two big aspects that I wanted to address, training uh, and monitoring, I'm going to start with the training piece. And these are some data that, um, that uh, we've just collected in our uh, agency internally. We have uh, about 32 employees, a variety of uh, master's level BCBAs, PhD level uh, BCBAs, and bachelor's level uh, behavioral technicians. Uh, and in Georgia, it's totally unregulated. People call themselves whatever they want. In fact, in Georgia, you can call yourself a behavior analyst if you don't have a high school degree. Um, now, as is true for the um, electronic data capture and management system, there are a number of different technology solutions that can help with training. And I'm always a little bit worried that I'll offend somebody. This isn't meant to be a comprehensive list. These are sort of the first four that I pulled up when I did a, a, a search for these types of services. The one that we use is called Autism Training Solutions, but there are at least three others that do similar things. So it's, you know, there's not necessarily anything that's particularly unique about what they do. But this is one that we use, and it mostly relates to uh, content training, right? Uh, a, an online training solution can't replace uh, real hands-on training, but it can certainly replace some content. So when we get a new employee, this is an average of hours that it takes to train a new person. Um, and all of our training is based on competence, so there's not a set, you need 50 hours. Basically, you get trained until you can do everything that your job description, or that's included in your job description. So on average, a, a bachelor's level uh, specialist takes a, about 55 hours to, to reach initial competence. And, and they have um, training that's sort of ongoing and, and that never ends, but to get to an initial place where you could sort of trust them to do some services, the average is about 55 hours before they get to um, competence. And then for our BCBAs, that average is, uh, as you might imagine, a little bit less. It's um, just over 40 hours. Now, of that time, uh, 20 hours, using a, this online system, it takes about 20 hours to train the content. Uh, now, before we started using this system, of course, that would vary, and it usually required a you know, a person to do it. If we needed to train a new group of em employees on content, and by content I mean you first have to start with, does this person understand reinforce, just the concept of reinforcement and prompting and fading and shaping and all those things that they're going to do, they first need to understand conceptually what uh, they look like. So using that system, it's, it's, it's about 20 hours. And as I mentioned before, there's still a pretty big chunk that actually has to be application. That's not something yet that we've found a way to, um, to replace, although I watched a commercial on the drive here. Well, I didn't watch a commercial on the drive here. I saw a commercial when we were stopped about a robot. So uh, I don't know if anybody's ever seen the, I think it might be a beer commercial, so maybe that's not appropriate. But uh, if, if they can train a robot to train people, then that would be a good technology solution. But this is just going to take people, right? This is just, that's going to take your, that's going to take manpower. That's going to take some of that away. But we can replace this, uh, the content. We can replace that with uh, an online training. So prior to uh, using that online training system, that first phase of content training cost about $2,200, just under $22 um, per employee. Um, now, of course, there's still all that, there's all the other cost with the practice training, but that initial one, um, generally costs about $2,200. Using an online system, the content mastery or getting someone to mastery in the content phase costs about $500. So the average per employee is about $500. So these are, these are just data for us. Clearly different organizations have you know, different standards and different things that they would expect from employees, but that's a pretty substantial uh, savings during that first, during this first section. Um, for us, so you can see that it's sort of roughly $1,600. Um, 
Now, the thing that I found most interesting was that the mastery of the practice phase or the time that it takes someone after they, they master everything that we uh, include for them in content was roughly unchanged. So it didn't take longer, it wasn't shorter, it doesn't appear that the online training for us uh, was either better or worse in terms of mastery of the content, which is what we wanted to see, right? I mean, it would have been great if it was better, if people you know, could sort of get through the practice stuff quicker, uh, but it was uh, roughly the same. Okay, any questions about that so far? So far, so good? I want to talk a little bit about monitoring. Um, and as I mentioned before, this is the company that I work for, so th these data are derived from uh, the use of that system. But there are a number of other similar systems that um, y you know, do similar things, and I obviously don't know exactly what they do because I don't use them. Um, but this isn't meant to be a comprehensive list. These are a few others, and you should certainly look into all of them. But at least based on their web pages, they're sort of described as uh, similar sorts of uh, technologies. In fact, at the very least, I know that these two, possibly Rethink Autism, also have mobile options where you can take data on a mobile device and then it sort of syncs with an online uh, system. But again, I would encourage you to look into that. Um, on your own. So these are some data that we collected from people who uh, use this system. Uh, and again, I'm just going to refer to it generally, an electronic data uh, capture and management system. Um, and there are about 90 people who responded to this. You can see most of them are uh, behavior analysts, or not most of them, I guess a good chunk of them, about 43% are behavior analysts, and about 16% of them uh, would sort of fit into the category of what used to be called in Florida years ago behavior specialist. There used to be a formal category for that. Um, and then there are a handful of, uh, of others, uh, teachers, administrators, uh, paraprofessionals, and then just sort of a smattering of other people who responded to this. Presumably, and hopefully this isn't um, way out of line, but presumably uh, the behavior analysts who respond have at least some notion of uh, the importance of accurate data and could report some of this as accurately as possible. I hope that's not an uh, inaccurate assumption. But these are the data that were collected from those uh, self-reports. And there's, there's really three main areas that uh, are pretty interesting. Um, as I mentioned before, if you've done intensive programming, particularly for um, people with autism, there's a lot of paperwork. And, and I don't just mean graphing. Right? You're um, filling out program sheets and um, collecting all sorts of uh, other data and writing learning objectives and writing procedures for every new learning objective. It's not just uh, the graphing. Frankly, even, uh, even if you're using Excel to do your graphing, that's uh, a time-consuming process. And um, there's probably not anybody any longer who does graphs by hand? Is there anybody who does their graphing by hand? Now you're too embarrassed to say it, right? <laughs> no, no, I don't do that. I love the tone. Hey, you don't need to do graphing by hand, right? You're not that elementary. You're not an idiot, are you? No, no, I don't know. Yeah, no. of course not, of course not. No, 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 no. But I transfer it to Excel. Yeah, there you go. I take a picture of it, so there's an electronic version. Um, well, I, I actually, in my master's program, I took data with a paper and pencil, it seems like, a long time ago. Um, and, and then I uh, eventually used a program called Cricut. Does anybody remember Cricut Graph? Yeah, it, it, it seemed awesome at the time. Now I look back and think, oh, that was so terrible. Um, or you're still using it, right? Oh, boy. <laughs> I just can't. Oh, boy. You know what? I'll just stop now. Yeah. That's what I did my data. Yeah, yeah, easy. yeah, I thought it was. But there's a lot of paperwork involved with all this, right? And for, for those respondents, um, they reported uh, about, you can see the average here, is about uh, 100 minutes or just over 100 minutes per student per week uh, on just paperwork. This doesn't include the graphing. Um, and of course, this varies based on your setting. Um, if you are in a school that provides intensive intervention or, uh, you know, an organization or agency that um, maybe serves severe behavior, you know that this, this 
um, there, there's probably many more minutes than that that go into your paperwork. And then, of course, in some places there's much less. There was quite a bit of variance there, but that was the average. Uh, and then the, the white line underneath is uh, the amount of time that people spent doing that um, after employing electronic data collection um, or electronic data capture and management system. So that's a, a savings of roughly half that time, and, and those, are, uh, those are savings per student per week. So that gets pretty substantial if, you have, if you're serving many uh, different learners and, and over long periods of time. As you might expect, there was a pretty big difference uh, in the time spent graphing. So the system that we use allows data capture on a mobile device like an iPad or an iPhone um, and then it automatically syncs it to an online portal where the data are graphed, um, not unlike uh, a stock ticker. So if you go to CNN and you click money and they have a stock ticker and you can make adjustments to both axes and, and sort of see stock data in, in a variety of ways, that's the system that we use. And, and so not surprisingly, there's, there's a pretty big reduction in the amount of time uh, spent graphing. In fact, because all of those data are automatically pulled over, it, I was kind of surprised there was any there at all. And I suspect that some of it relates to just that analysis, um, even though we had a separate category for that. So you can see that that was reduced from just under 80 minutes uh, per student per week uh, to just over 20 minutes per student per week. And then one of the other uh, sort of big differences in, in the data that we looked at uh, related to analyzing that information. Um, so in addition to all the paperwork and doing all your graphing, it, you all, the, the point with all of that is to analyze those data, right? You want to look at your graph and make decisions uh, based on those graphs that you're looking at. Um, and that was roughly, or the baseline data for that was roughly an hour per week per student. And this, by the way, includes both uh, skill acquisition and behavior reduction data. Um, and that actually was reduced a little bit. So it's, you know, it's the same data, the same graphs, but um, people reported spending a little bit less time um, doing that. And then something that's uh, sort of ancillary to all this um, it relates to writing reports. This is the thing that I hate the most. Um, and you wouldn't think it would be so, right? I can get on my laptop and you know, put some music on, it ought to be uh, relaxing, but it's just not. I hate writing reports. Um, and so this particular uh, system that we use allows for building a template and it automatically pulls data into a report and you can sort of add notes to it as, as uh, you see fit. Um, but those, uh, the amount of time spent writing progress reports was reduced from about four hours per report to about 45 minutes um, per report. So obviously that is dependent on how much time you, you know, spend writing reports. Now I thought this was pretty interesting also. In addition to uh, the amount of time saved on, on these particular tasks, uh, almost three quarters of the people who responded said they actually are now collecting more data. So they spend less time graphing it and analyzing it, but they're actually collecting more. Um, so I found that pretty encouraging. Now one last uh, um, little um, bit of information to consider about this. We also wanted to look at accuracy and we had the opportunity to, to sort of look at this firsthand instead of uh, getting information from users. Um, we have a school in Atlanta called Keystone and it's a, um, I suspect, a fairly garden variety uh, uh, intensive intervention uh, type of school. It's a private school um, with about 15 kids and 40 staff, so we get a lot of uh, referrals for uh, very um, either severely impaired or severe behavior. We get a lot of referrals for, for kids and, and in some cases adolescents who just can't be served somewhere else. Um, and so there are uh, people who have two or three or even four staff apiece. And it's about 30 hours a week, so they get in intensive intervention about 30 hours a week, and as I mentioned, at least one-on-one. -on -one. Um, there is at least one BCBA on staff doing all the tasks that, uh, uh, that I've already talked about. And what we really wanted to look at was um, 
how accurate is information being uh, collated and stored and used and, and managed over time? Because it's really occurred to me that when we use so much paper, especially when we transfer that information to graphing programs like Cricut or Excel, surely there have to be errors. I mean, we know that people just don't transcribe information perfectly all the time, but most people don't really consider that, right? You look at your Excel graph and it, it is what it is. You don't uh, consider the fact that somebody may have their denominator wrong or, the, or their numerator has an extra zero in it. Um, and it was actually kind of troubling to see how many errors were made. So these are the archival data that we went back through. Um, and we found that, uh, first of all, there were mountains of data. I mean, we had mountains of skill acquisition, tons of behavior reduction data. Um, and this represents about a 2 to 3% error rate. Um, and I don't know for sure if that's consistent with other places. It, you know, it, it sort of seems low, but anything above zero kind of seems high, right? If, if you know there's something wrong in this pile, but you don't know what it is, how can you accurately make decisions on any of it? Um, and we've, so we found that there were about 15 errors per learner per week uh, on average. Now, most of those were transcription. Right? It was supposed to be a three and somebody presumably hit four instead. So they're not monumental mistakes. We didn't keep, you know, confuse somebody's IEP. Wait, this is Joshua, not Michael. Um, but so, this, you know, so they were generally probably not earth shattering mistakes. But how do you, you, don't, you know mistakes are being made, but you don't know exactly what they are. How, how do you decide if they're earth shattering mistakes? So it was, it was pretty scary. And then about 25% of them related to just decision-making errors. So if you have criteria for your service recipients, whether they're kids or adults, I, I mean, I have a tendency to, to talk about kids because that's mostly who, who I work with, but this is true for adults too. If you have criteria that you set up ahead of time, we're gonna do this program, and when this person reaches this level, then we'll do the next thing, whatever it is, right? We'll start to you know, fade prompts or supports or, or, or whatever the plan is, um, and you don't hit that accurately, um, you're either making treatment errors or you're wasting time and money, or both, right? So what we tended to see was um, either uh, particular skills were worked on past mastery. So if we said for this kid, mastery criteria is whatever. You know, you say 80%, three days in a row or four out of five days, at least two therapists, whatever you might use as your mastery criteria. Once it's met, if, if that's what you decide mastery is, once it's met, you're, you need to stop and move to the next thing, right? And we found that uh, without really good uh, interaction with the data, and paper can be a barrier to that, there were often targets, objectives that were worked on longer than they needed to be. Not a huge mistake, right? but certainly uh, not a good use of time. Um, and, and then there were also sometimes what we've referred to as premature uh, mastery. So wait a minute, we're looking at this data, that's, that's not mastered yet. We weren't ready to move on to the next thing. Um, and clearly uh, we don't wanna make those mistakes. They seem small, but if they're not mistakes, then don't bother with mastery criteria, right? If, if you have them, then you need to make decisions based on them. Uh, so it, it's important to make uh, these appropriate treatment decisions, but one of the things that I, many of you might be able to relate to, and this has changed a lot, I think even in the last 10 to 20 years, it's also a liability to you as a professional in the agency that you work for uh, when there are inaccuracies in your data. So it, does anybody in here do work in public schools? couple of people. Have any of you been involved in uh, due process hearings or lawsuits or a few of you? Well, if an attorney finds one error, that argument makes sense, right? If there's one error, how do I know there aren't more? And if, if there are more, how can we rely on any of these data? How do we know this kid made any progress? That's clearly a, a large liability that, uh, that we want to avoid, frankly, in all settings. Um, but it's, it, that's an important to consider um, as a professional. Now, there are also some other things that uh, I think are important about uh, using an electronic data collection and management system. 
And I definitely can't speak to those other systems about whether they're HIPAA compliant. The one that we use is HIPAA compliant, but uh, I, presumably the others are. But you know, don't use them and say, well, Kobe said they were, and, and then get in trouble for it. Um, but that's an important piece. And as it turns out, and I'm sure many of you can relate to this, you imagine that it's easy to secure paper, but it's, it's actually pretty cumbersome, right? So do you, are you HIPAA compliant with all your paper? Access to it is limited. You're keeping all the correct um, information over the correct amount of time. It's locked up in a particular place and monitored and, and so forth. Um, I, I know for a fact, based on public schools that I've worked in, that none of that happens. I mean, people have access to that data who shouldn't, and it probably doesn't end up making a di or probably doesn't end up hurting anybody. But you know, that's strictly not HIPAA compliant. So at least in that sense, having data um, man stored and collected, stored and managed online helps you restrict access to that data more so than if you have paper. You can control who um, can access and use uh, and add to or change that information to a greater extent than, than you could uh, with paper. And it can't be misplaced, stolen or damaged. It's not going to end up uh, in a fire. I'm sure some of you have been in situations where it's just, I, I don't know where that program book is. Um, you know, it was in the closet with the others, or the data sheet from Wednesday is just gone, and it, and it, and it might not be a big deal, um, but clearly that's uh, not HIPAA compliant. And it, it, it could cause, you know, pretty big problems. The flip side of that, though, is it's also easier to manage um, granting other people more access to those data. And I'll give you two examples of this. Um, particularly for people in remote areas. So I have a few kids who I work with in Alabama, and for years I had to drive to Alabama once a week. I'm, I'm sure a lot of you can relate to this, you know, log in the miles. Um, because I needed to do those things I described earlier. I needed to see the person. I needed to see the provision of services. All the data was on paper. I needed to see it, you know. I, I mean, I guess they could fax it to me, fax 500 pages of data to me, and I could review it that way. Um, but I needed, to, I needed to have my boots on the ground to do all those things that are important in the provision of state-of-the-art services. When the data is electronic, it's much more easier to let people access it who need it. So, for example, those people that I serve in Alabama, I could log in right now and see how they did today. I could review their data from today. I could review their data from five minutes ago. Um, I could review video of them from five minutes ago in the same system. Um, so I can actually access that information in real time, I can access it whenever I want, and it doesn't involve me going anywhere. So it's easier, if I need to do this every week, that's, you know, that's not a barrier anymore. I, I still need the time to do it, but I don't have to drive to the middle of Alabama. Is anybody in here from Alabama? Uh, beautiful state. But it's, <laughs> it's, it's long. <laughs> um, and here's another situation. For those of you who have worked in schools, you've probably um, had some experience with what's often referred to as home notes, right? So um, let's say you have a, a kid with, frankly, any disability that prevents them from using language adequately, right? So most of my kids like that have autism, but it, it, it's, not, it's not exclusive to kids with autism. Well, they're receiving services in a school or an agency or organization, and the only way that their parents know how they're doing, how they're progressing, how they did today is information that's sent home, right? And so in my experience, those parents understandably want a lot of that information. And they want it as quickly as possible, not a once a month summary, but daily information and not just smiley faces and, you know, did he eat lunch or did he not eat lunch? I mean, that may be important, but I, frankly, that's the last thing I ask my kids when they come home from school. So they need lots of information. And so in, in programs that try to, to do this well, what, what they end up doing is at the end of the day, one or more staff persons uh, sort of summarizes data from the day, right? I might go through every IEP objective or learning objective or you know wherever you are and write down an average percentage or maybe copy a trial sheet or, or, or somehow collate information about the day to, to send home uh, to parents. And you find, I'm sure, 
that that takes a lot of time. And not, uh, not just time, y you will invariably get something who, someone who writes something wrong on one of those sheets. Um, you know, oh, it was a terrible day, he was out of control, or, you know, and then it's going to end up offending somebody, or he threw a sandwich at lunch, and you were trying to describe that, and, you know, you get a call, why is he eating sandwiches at lunch? He's, you know, he's not supposed to be having bread. Um, so a lot of times information is not, uh, tran uh, is not transferred accurately, or the sort of information that we want. Using a system like I've described, um, that access can be provided to parents um, in a way that security is controlled. So with our parents, they have read-only rights to data, so they can see it all. They can't go in and change it. You know, oh, wow, that was, wow, he's learning a lot. Um, <laughs> but uh, they can access it all. They can see it. So it, it, for uh, our staff, it doesn't take any time at all. They don't have to summarize anything. It's already there. Uh, and a parent can, frankly, get more access to it, not just once a day. They can log in whenever they want. They can log in at noon and see how the morning went. And for any of you who are administrators, there's quite a bit more accountability as well. So I, I could log in now and see how all of my staff did today, um, how they performed uh, with uh, all of their clients, how much they did, and, and when they do it. So there's quite a bit of advantage there as well. So we can, using a system like that, we can provide more feedback to parents with less effort. And if you're really interested in making big changes, you know that in addition to the fact that parents just want that information, we also know that that can help, right? If parents know quickly how their students are, are doing, what they're struggling with, um, what they're doing well with, uh, maybe with a little bit of help, they can uh, also enhance those uh, effects at home. And they're always, those are always available, and as I mentioned, um, there's some increased accountability as well. Now, just as, since we're talking about technology, I also wanted to mention just a few other things that may be useful. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about each of these. And again, this isn't a comprehensive list. These are just a few things that um, I find pretty useful. Um, for things like forms and surveys, we use a couple of different technologies. One is called Formstack. One is called SurveyGizmo. Um, particularly for uh, consents to evaluate and consents to release confidential information, uh, we've found this to be pretty useful um, because then it doesn't need to be a barrier, right? There's this kid that it's an emergency and we need to start an evaluation right away. Well, parents don't have access to a fax machine and we need to get these consents before we start. Don't start, get the consent first. Um, well, this is an easy way to remove that as a barrier. We can get some of that um, paperwork done electronically. Some of you may have uh, services where you need signatures of some sort. Um, so in, in a lot of our in-home services, parents sign, right? So if a, uh, if a technician works with a kid from two to four, they have a sign-in sheet and the parent signs, yes, you know, they were here and they were here uh, verifying the time that they were there. We use something called Sign Now. Um, all of my staff have iPads, and, and so instead of collecting paper and sending me paper at the end of the month, which used to make me crazy, uh, somebody missed a signature. Oh, you missed the thing, and you got to go back to the parent's house and get them to sign it and bring it back to me. It was, you know, a disaster. So now they can get all those signatures and sign now, and I can log in whenever I want and download those sign-in sheets in real time. Um, so that's a pretty useful piece of technology. Most of these are um, pretty inexpensive or even free in many cases for sort of limited versions of, of the technology. I'm sure most of you are familiar with uh, things like WebEx or Skype or GoToMeeting. Again, there are several other uh, products that do similar things, but this is another technology that reduces uh, uh, that geographic barrier. Um, so I if you need to have a meeting, we don't all have to drive to Alpharetta, Georgia and sort of fit it into our schedules. We can do this um, online. It can't totally replace, you know, breathe in the same air. We still have to, you know, mix in some, you know, we're all going to get together in this same place. Uh, but it can certainly uh, replace some of them. Um, file transfers, we use something called file, file locker. Um, and this is one that is uh, also free if you have small uh, amounts of data, but it's HIPAA compliant. 
Um, and just in case you didn't know, I almost cringe when I say this, you know it's not HIPAA compliant to just email uh, client information. So if you write a report, you can't just email it. Um, this is uh, a technology that's pretty simple to use and it's pretty user friendly, even if you're sending a, a, a file to a parent, as long as they have a password um, and it's inexpensive. And then lastly, um, there are a, a couple examples here and there are several others. Central Reach, NPA Works, they're kind of scheduling billing payroll systems. Um, as I mentioned way back at the beginning, scheduling is a, it tends to be a barrier for, um, you know, getting all those things done and having a system that keeps track of everybody's schedule so that at a moment I could log in and see where everybody is and, and what they're doing is, is pretty helpful for that. So that's just a brief sort of mix of those things. Now, this is my favorite part, and I know I just have a few minutes left because I, I promised to um, finish early, and I know some of you are watching. Um, but I, I just want to daydream with you for a few minutes. So in the Catalyst system that I described, there are now, well, this, this, these data are about two weeks old, so there's probably about 25 million data points in the system right now and in fact we sat down and sort of projected this forward um, and projected that by the end of the decade we'll have a billion data points and that's just in Catalyst and that's just you know with a, a handful of users but I think that there are opportunities that never existed before to analyze huge amounts of treatment data at a very uh, fine level and I'm just going to mention uh, a few of those um, and hope to solicit some of your ideas as well. And even though there's lots of variability, those huge numbers help with that, right? So we're talking about lots of agencies all over the world and, um, you know, almost certainly there is variance in quality, um, but it's e sort of easier to measure quantity or sort of treatment dosage. Um, but with those huge amounts of data, and by the way, they're <laughs> I'm not Edward Snowden here. I'm just talking, you know, conceptually here. We're not a doing um, meta-analysis. Is that what it was called? What was he doing? What's the NSA doing with my emails? Meta-analysis? Yeah. That's, this, you know, so I haven't done anything yet, but I'm just imagining what I could do with this, but I don't want to live in Russia. Is anybody here from Russia? <laughs> no? Um, so clearly, uh, age is something that is uh, looked at quite a bit. Um, you know, what, uh, what's important about uh, the onset of treatment and how old a, a kid is, and there are all these variables that sort of go into treatment outcomes. What kind of services do they get? What level of services and quality? And, and when do they start getting them and, and, and how long? We could analyze those on a, on a very specific level, not just elementary age, but, you know, at uh, uh, seven years and, and two months, what, what are the sort of data that we get for those kind of kids? Treatment dosage, I'm sure all of you um, are you know, interested in what's important about treatment dosage. And of course, um, Dr. Green is one of the foremost experts in the world on that. So she's probably gonna want access to my data. Um, uh, and uh, interfering behaviors. So what are the correlations between uh, treatment outcomes and a, a huge variety of interfering behaviors and, and how do we make predictions about um, you know the, or prognosis about where a kid might be based on this sort of information.